Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening. These various greetings come to you again from the quietness of our worship center. Come here to film yet another message that will hopefully bring peace, maybe even a smile, uh, along with uh, words of understanding as we look again into the life of the resurrected Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Hi, my name is Pastor Deborah Schauer, and I'm here at Spirit of Hope United Methodist Church, bringing you yet another message via the internet. Now, even though I know we would all rather gather together in this place of worship, we all understand for our safety and well-being, we have to do worship, if you will, differently, knowing that um, we will, we will come together with each other sometime in the future. As we come to this time, um, <clears throat> what's interesting, I don't know how many of you are aware of this, but there's a lot that goes together in bringing this message to you. Um, a lot of different thought, innovative ways that we can make worship interesting. Uh, but I, I kind of wonder, what are you doing on your side to make this time of worship? Oh, special. Um, I came across an article that um, basically was put together by Constance Cherry, and, and she talks about seven tips for engaging with live-streamed worship. Um, she goes on to talk about how it, this is a two-way street, really. We're preparing here at Spirit of Hope, the United Methodist Church, but you also should be preparing at home for this time of worship. And maybe you're wondering, well, how do I do this? How do uh, I get ready for worship? Um, her article goes into this whole idea about this part on your part is very important, too. Um, she says these words, she says, the most fundamental shift to make is moving from watching to participating, from passive observing a, a produced service uh, to fully engaging into an active worshiper. And here's some suggestions, and I want to share just a few of them with you. I'm not going to go through the whole list, but maybe next week I might share some other ones. First one is build anticipation. Ah, talk to your family the night before about how exciting it will be to worship together live. Well, it's not so much live here, but to worship together on the couch, maybe outside, uh, on your patio. Those who live alone, ah, share your joy with them. Uh, if, they, if they can't quite know how to do it, maybe you can help someone else to do this. Uh, maybe you can invite them to your home, keeping that physical distance always in mind. Another thing is to prepare uh, the technology in advance. Get ready. Nothing worse than, oh, uh, not hooking up to the Internet at the right time or, or all the different things. So kind of do a trial run before you sit down to watch worship. And here's the one thing that I thought is nice, is create a worshipful setting. You know, maybe you can light a candle. You know, you saw us. We have the candles lit here. But maybe you can light a candle before we get ready to go into it. Um, these are just some ideas of remembering how we can come together uh, it's not so much uh, about you and me, but it's how we connect with God and how we can make that experience even that much more um, spirit-filled, if you will. So those are just some ideas. But, you know, right now, I want to say that it is a time for worship. Crisis cannot stop the cross. When the future is uncertain, we do not lean on our own understanding. 
for he is our ever-present help in times of trouble. Though the earth may tremble and the mountains fall into the sea, we do not fear, because he is the rock of our salvation. And when crisis knocks at our door and the things of earth are like dust in the wind, we stand firm, believing in the promise that we rest safely in his hands. For this is why he came, why he lived, and why he died, that we might have life and have it more abundantly, and take comfort in the knowledge that he is our king. Because we know that when all seemed lost and death thought it had won, crisis could not stop the cross. That was an interesting video that spoke about the cross and the importance of the cross. You know, how many of you wear a cross? You know, I always wear a cross. I have a number of different ones, some that I like more than others. But for us right now, it's, it's basically um, kind of sanitized. When we see a, saw, a cross, we usually comment on how pretty it is. Or how, oh, that's unique. I've never seen one like that. You know, the history behind the cross is not quite so um, inviting. Uh, We know that the cross during the time of Jesus was a form of torture. It was basically a terrible, terrible death sentence that would be placed on someone if they had to go to the cross. The cross wasn't anything pretty. John Hellram has put together a beautiful poem that speaks about the cross. Um, It's his viewpoint, if you will. And he says these words uh, that I want to share with you as an introduction to his poem. He says this, In writing Christian themes, there is a place where my life is overlaid by what I want to say in the peace. I do not say that Christ actually experienced this conversation, but as a writer, I could identify with him saying it. Here are these words from John in an original poem. Point of view. Father, Abba, I hang here upon the cross you've chosen on this day to dignify. Father, this is an awful place. You know I would rather not have climbed it. You know how hard I wept. You know, I, I wanted to avoid the crushing pain. Abba, here I hang. I look down upon confusion, wrath, indignity, weeping, gambling, scheming, friends hanging back in fear, enemies screaming and reviling, exulting in what they perceive as my demise, as your defeat. Abba, there is so much hatred. They only remember their pain their rejection, their failure. They assign blame. They hold grudges. They are unforgiving. They imagine themselves to be unforgiven, to be unforgivable. Father, 
it's only a few short days remaining until we provide a new understanding, until we are fulfilled in a new covenant, sealed between you and all the world, you and all mankind. Abba, Father, here I am, alone, broken, seemingly lost to the world. Satan's apparent prize in the spiritual warfare waged for the souls of men. Here I am, forgiving a thief who redeemed his life in a moment of support, asking you to forgive them in their unknowing, asking my brother to be my mother's son, asking you why you leave me hanging here, feeling for a moment forsaken. Father, Abba, I have refused the bitter drink from the end of the lance. I've watched them below gambling for my robe, rolling dice for my sandals. I am ready to pass on. Abba, from here I see the rock in which I will be laid. I see below where souls await my liberation. I see from here grace upon grace, salvation, forgiveness, and forgiving, repentance, restoration, joy, and I see from here judgment, retribution, winnowing fans on the threshing floor, sheep and goats, separation, loss, I see from here that I am the way. I see from here that I must be friend to sinners, to the unloved as the unloving. I see that I present a new path. I offer humility. I bring peace. I bring assurance. I deliver your best desire for the least of them, for the worst of them, for the best of them for the rest of them. I see the end of days wherein your name will be justified before all the world. Father, Abba, I see from here what it is to do your will. Abba, I am willing into your hands I commend my spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, John, for those moving words. You have a way of touching the soul, and we appreciate you sharing your gift with us. We know that a lot of different things are going on with people within our congregation, within our members, within our neighbors. Um, and so we come together for a time of prayer. Um, prayer is not something that's frightening or it doesn't need to be frightening. For prayer is really basically where you're... you're Focusing in on God. You're sharing uh, some good quality time with God. The one thing about prayer is that we have to remember that it is a two-way street. Sometime we need to stop ourselves and listen to what God has to say. I invite you right now to come to a time of prayer Basically, I'm going to lift up some words. You might be listening along, and you might be agreeing with words that I say, but no, this is also your time of coming together for, for a time of prayer, a time of talking with God. So let's pray together. Oh, gracious God, we come to you this time, and we give thanks. We give thanks to you 
For it is right uh, and good to give our thanks and praise. It is a good and joyful thing to say these words of thanks to you. Almighty God, creator of heaven and earth, you formed us in your image and breathed into each one of us the breath of life. When our love failed, your love remained steadfast. When captive to fear and oppression, you made covenant to be our sovereign God. Brought us to a a land flowing with milk and honey and set before us the way of life. By your great mercy, we have been born anew in, uh, to a, a living hope through the resurrection of your Son, who rose from the dead, and then by inheriting wow, a place of honor next to you. That place of honor is imperishable, undefiled, and unfailing. Now, as your people, we we boldly declare your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us to freedom, life, and wholeness. By your Spirit, keep us in Christ. Unite us to one another and to all the world. Sustain the sick and comfort the dying. Strengthen all who minister in your name. Lift lift us from from doubt and despair and, and lead us, gracious Lord, to last and be a part of this heavenly banquet that you have prepared for us. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forevermore. Amen. So with the confidence of God, let us go as children of God to repeat, uh, as we do many times, a prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. How many of you know that we have a labyrinth on our property? Yeah, it's located just north of um, our worship center. We have a brochure that explains the purpose of a labyrinth and why we'd have one here, and and then kind of goes a little bit more into how to do a labyrinth. What's the point? You know, I have um, come out to this labyrinth that's next to our our worship center many times. Many times to pray, to commune with God, or maybe just enjoy some peace and a time to get out of my office and commune with God, but also with nature. Our labyrinth here is, uh, I know it's a labor of love. And we know those people who are involved with it. Um, it is a joy any time I come to a church and I see that. So hopefully you'll spend some time and maybe go out there and check of it. But, you know, a labyrinth is basically a, a maze-like pattern um, inlaid in a number of different ways. Um, usually it's a simple design, which is um, easy to follow, uh, or a construction Uh, that can be full of all sorts of uh, passageways and blind alleys. A labyrinth can be set up in a garden, within a building, or even 
in your hand to where you can sit there and meditate and draw through the labyrinth. You know, when I was in Europe, I, I visited a castle. Uh, and the, the garden there had this enormous labyrinth uh, that was basically set up with shrubs um, that had different passageways of going through. You could view this labyrinth from steps that were part of the castle, and so you could see, like, the whole big picture. And, and I sat back, and I, I, I looked at what was set out before me and thinking, ah, oh, this should be fun. You know, as a kid, I always loved going, and probably still today would love to do it, or going through those fun houses that they have and the carnivals and everything. So I thought, well, this might be fun. So I basically looked at... Um, this whole maze that was sitting out before me. Yeah, I was trying to put it into my mind and figuring, ah, I think I can see how to get through this maze of greenery. <laughs> Had that big picture in my mind. And so I proceeded through the maze, this maze of greenery. Um, I, along with other guests, of the castle or the gardens began to walk through this maze. I had to, I kept trying to keep my, my eye on that, that picture of the maze that I had, I'd made from the steps at the foot of the castle um, so that I could find my way to the end. As I walked along, others would say, you know, you're going the wrong way. Or they would say, well, this is the way out. Come this way. Oh, as I began to uh, head into dead ends, or maybe I had to step back and retrace my steps, all of a sudden that picture that I had in my mind of this complete labyrinth <laughs> was completely lost. I, I found uh, that I, I, after I finally made my way through the maze, not by seeing and remembering the completed picture that I had of the labyrinth, but basically by hit and miss or the help of someone else. This walk through this labyrinth was, was not peaceful, but time-consuming. Oh, it was not revealing, but baffling. It was not inspiring. It was downright frustrating. You know, a labyrinth or, or a maze can be a uh, great amusement, or it can be very frustrating as we make our way through it. Certain events in our lives uh, hmm, can be like a labyrinth. Yeah, you know, coming to dead ends, regrouping, challenging, uh, uh, amusing, or just plain frustrating. You know, as we continue through our servant series, the Easter Challenge, we, like the disciples, seek the evidence behind the resurrection of Jesus that we just experienced, hoping it will transform our lives in some special way. My prayer is that we will all go deeper into the truth of who God has created us to be so we can learn to stand on his promises, renew our, our thinking, and find nourishment for our souls, something that we, I think, desperately need. So to help us see uh, some great evidence relating to the resurrection, we go to the gospel according to Luke, and we read about two of Jesus' disciples walking through the evidence on the way to Emmaus. After Jesus had been taken from them and brutally crucified on the cross, the disciples of Jesus were left confused and downhearted. It had been three days since the tragedy when two of the disciples began the seven-mile journey to a village called Emmaus. When they traveled together, they talked about the things that had happened. At a certain point in their journey, another man joined them and continued with them in conversation. 
The man was Jesus, their beloved master, but the disciples did not recognize him. The man asked, what is it that you are talking about? The disciples were surprised that he was not aware of the recent events that had shaken the city. With a sorrowful look, Cleopas, one of the two disciples, answered the stranger, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened over the past days? Jesus pretended not to know, saying, What things? The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a great and mighty prophet, they replied. Our own chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be contemned to death, and they crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to save all of Israel, but here we are, three days later, left alone and confused. And to add to the confusion, some of the women in our group came back from the tomb and declared to us that the body was gone, that they had seen a vision of angels who told them he was alive. Jesus responded to their words, How foolish you are, and how slow to believe all that has been recorded in Scripture. Did the prophet say that the Messiah would have to suffer these things first? Then he opened up the scriptures and began to show them everything concerning himself. The disciples were completely amazed at the man's words, so that when they arrived at their destination, they strongly urged him to stay and join them for supper. Jesus agreed to stay and sat down with the men. He took the bread before him, gave thanks to God, broke it, and handed the pieces to the disciples, and it was in that moment that they finally recognized him as Jesus, their beloved master. But no sooner did they recognize him that he vanished from their sight. The two disciples were filled with awe and completely overwhelmed as they recounted every word that Jesus had spoke to them. They exclaimed, didn't our hearts burn with us while he talked to us on the road and while he showed us the scriptures? Their eyes had been opened and their troubled hearts set free. The stranger was Jesus, the long-awaited Messiah, and he was indeed alive. We are told these two disciples are making their way to Emmaus. You know, we really don't know why. As they travel, they discuss all these things that had happened. They were recounting their memory of the past week in, in Jerusalem, trying to remember the big picture of all the events that had just happened. You remember those events, right? Yeah. Those events that they are probably recounting. In one week, so much had happened. Jesus Oh, had a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Everyone loved him. Remember the words that they shouted out? Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Oh, and then Jesus basically stepped into the temple and did something, oh, that kind of caused the disciples to take a step back. He started driving out the merchants that were in the temple. Oh, he continued teaching, though, as he did this, and everyone was attentive to hear what he had to say. Jesus' authority was questioned. Some just didn't understand and stopped questioning him, but they decided to do something else. Jesus had his last meal with them. Oh, and then there was the betrayal, and, and then the arrest. And no one was there for Jesus. Jesus went through this trial and beating and death, and, and still no one was there. What awaited him was the cross. He was hung on that cross, and he was cursed throughout society. <clears throat> what was there was dead ends, blind alleys, a labyrinth of frustration and pain. These two travelers to Emmaus were depressed, discouraged, and downcast. Life had fallen in for them because Jesus had been 
crucified. They saw no hope, no way, no how. And as they made their way to Emmaus, they um, are reminded of the cruelty and the hatred that was running rapid as they saw the rows of crosses with victims crucified on them. Then, if their frustration and pain was not enough, somewhere along the way, a a third person had joined them. And it appeared that he did not have the slightest idea of what they were talking about. Although this this companion or eavesdropper had been in Jerusalem, he did not act as if he had heard anything that had transpired. He, he basically didn't act like he had heard the shouts of the mob, the sounds of the lash, the clash of the hammer against the spikes. <laughs> you know, I have to ask you, have you ever had someone come into a conversation that you were having with another individual And the one entering into this conversation had no clue what you were talking about. (laughs) I've experienced that. And you know what that can be? It can be very frustrating. Because what do you have to do? You have to catch them up on what you've been talking about. And chances are they do not have the same passion or emotion that you have regarding what you've been talking about which adds to the frustration. This, I think, is what Cleopas was feeling and and facing. And and boy, I I can relate. You can just picture the expression on his face, that of amazement. Then it turns to pain and disappointment as he says these words. We were hoping that he, that is Jesus, would be the one who would save us. Can you get a sense of his pain, uh, the dead end that he's feeling of his frustration? But just like in the labyrinth, a way uh, out was shown. Insight came. This stranger basically spoke of disappointment and achievements, banishment and renewal, faith and unfaith. (laughs) Uh, He spoke of dead ends, but also promised new beginnings. You know, as Christ joined them on the road and asked why they were discouraged, they explained the situation and their disappointment. And Jesus said to him these words, oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. And then he taught them from the scriptures. I think we could say, in other words, they had not been paying attention to the revealed word of God. And and Jesus was basically saying to them, you too are discouraged for no reason. You think you have come to a dead end, but you know what? You haven't. If you would have listened to the word of God, you would know that what has happened is a fulfillment of prophecy. Because they weren't listening to the word, but listening to the world, if you will, they were unnecessarily depressed. But when Jesus began teaching them, they listened. Oh, they were all ears. If you want things revealed, the first thing you need is an ear to hear what needs to be revealed. And also, you need to have that desire to hear. Just in case you didn't hear those words that I gave to you, I want to repeat them. If you want things revealed, the first thing you need is an ear to hear what needs to be revealed and also the desire to hear it. You know, when you combine a a listening ear with a desire to hear, then revelation can come. These travelers begged him to stay with them 
<laughs> they wanted more insight. You know, God does this for us. God will let us hear the word, and then God will bring something into our lives to see whether or not <laughs> we heard it, or whether we're just sitting there, perhaps not listening at all. Jesus will bring something into our lives to put to the test that which we have heard. Oh, we must have the desire, the desire that is ready to be revealed and enlightened. You know, as these travelers ended uh, their walk, <clears throat> basically they arrived in Emmaus. <clears throat> these two followed the wonderful example of their forefathers. They basically offered their house as a refuge for the stranger that they just met on the road. <clears throat> they did not want this traveler first thought to be uninformed intruder. Oh, they just didn't want him to leave. It was really too late to go on with the day anyway. So they offered the hospitality commanded by God through Moses. It was a simple meal set before them. Night was descending upon them, and perhaps this newfound friend, oh, what could give more insight to them, ah, be much more instructive to them. As they ate, they handed the bread so he could break off a portion. Oh, a very simple task, but it was very revealing. And the, event, the evidence came forth. Hopefully, you do not miss the significance of uh, Christ revealing himself and having it identified through the bread. Bread is the symbol for Christ. It is the table at this table that these men uh, are brought face to face with the person and the mission of Jesus Christ. They are also brought face to face with the person and the mission of him, of what he's planning to do. In that meal, they celebrate. Did with um, we celebrate in that meal our own death and our life in Jesus Christ? But Jesus does not uh, allow us any more than he allowed these disciples to just relax and enjoy uh, the fellowship of his table, simply uh, talking about the Lord and, and what the resurrection experience means to us as though that's all there is to the Easter appearances of Jesus. When we say these wonderful words, Christ is risen, he is risen indeed, uh, then we are instructed to listen and to respond to what else Jesus has to say to us. For then Jesus says, you are my witnesses. Just as the disciples witnessed in the first century of the Christian era, it is our business to show the world what we do and say that the Lord is really alive and that he is indeed the Lord of all. You know, that, that is really a, a truly um, significant part of the continuing story about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Those who hear it and believe that it is true are, are charged with the responsibility of passing it on to the rest of the world so that all people will have the opportunity to hear and then believe. You know, as the bread is broken, then an, a miracle occurs. As the stranger broke the bread and blessed it, they knew who he was. He was the one who had written the cult into the city. He was the one who had been lashed. He was uh, the one who had been nailed to the cross. He was the hope of Israel, a hope that seemed crushed, with his death. 
the Romans were still in power. The people of God were still a captive nation. Some things had not changed, but now the travelers from Jerusalem, they traveled to Jerusalem, to Emmaus, and found their way out of the labyrinth. Even though Jesus Jesus, uh, vanished from their sight in that instant, everything changed. They were uh, uh, alive with joy and excitement, and they didn't want to to share it. They couldn't wait, that is, to share it with others. So they got up, and they went back to Jerusalem that same night. Those two travelers had experienced such a reality uh, that they couldn't wait to share it with others. For evidence (laughs) that Jesus was alive came right there in front of them. Their walk was transformed. The depression was gone. Their presence became their future, new and and different, because Easter keeps happening. Those many years ago, two individuals were on a road, even though the road was familiar, was full of uh, blind alleys, dead ends, frustration, a metal labyrinth, if you will. But these two discovered Jesus in their midst. We too have, oh, a a road or a walk that may be familiar and also full of blind alleys and dead ends and frustration and mental labyrinth dealing with social or physical distancing. But we can discover Jesus also because Easter keeps happening. Remember, Jesus came to give you himself. He promised to be here. Recognize Jesus is here in our midst. Reach out. Talk to him. Experience a a walk through the evidence with him. Amen. As you travel through the labyrinth of life, God will be with you. Stand on that promise. We are given to, um, it is given to each one of us. But the other side of that is that you need to open your heart. You need to open your heart to the the mystery and grace that God reveals through us. Let the evidence that is so purely seen in the scripture give you confidence. God bless you all. Have a great week.